So for my uh, last talk and last talk of the day, um, the objectives really are to have you gain a little bit of an understanding of usual fruit and vegetable intake by the population, be able to recognize and define a few terms that, that describe some of the components of fruits and vegetables, such as phytonutrients or flavonoids, um, be able to describe a little bit about the association between fruit and vegetable intake and, and health outcomes and mechanisms that may um, underpin those. And then just as we were mentioning in the transition between these two talks really is to talk about the challenges of implementing successful interventions for increasing fruit and vegetable intake. And as I implied, and as you all probably know, the fruit and vegetable intake of the US population is is really pretty dismal, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. So this is data that comes from um, in Haines data that goes back as far. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, goes back as far as the 1988 through 94. That's the blue gray bar, and then somewhat more recent ones, 99, 2000. And if you look at at over time, total fruit and vegetable intake, it's virtually the same. Um, and it is, is right around three or so for all together. If you look at, at fruit, it's one or a little bit more vegetable, uh, close to two. If you take out fried potatoes, french fries and things, uh, vegetable servings go down a little bit. But overall, you know, we're still really below the USDA guidelines. USDA guidelines are, are um, trying to get two fruits and three vegetable servings a day for a total of five or greater. And so this reflects a, a lack of progress through um, campaigns such as five a day, through other campaigns. So uh, when we finish the talk, we'll come back to brainstorming of what else could we do? How, how could we really go about changing this and at what level? So we do have certainly epidemiologic associations and pretty strong and convincing evidence that higher fruit and vegetable intakes are associated with lower incidence of some of these chronic diseases, coronary heart disease, hypertension, uh, stroke. There's also evidence of, of uh, protective association against cancer and type 2 diabetes. This evidence is not quite as strong as for uh, coronary heart disease, but it, it's still present and it's still a very probable evidence. I think um, part of it may be related to the etiology of cancer. There's so many different types of cancers with different mechanisms, and that may dilute out the effect a little bit. Um, type 2 diabetes, some of the effect may be mediated through weight, uh, weight gain or weight maintenance. Um, some evidence certainly with, with obesity, although you know, I, I have to say that there's not strong evidence saying eating four or five or more fruit and vegetable intakes will definitely prevent obesity. You know, there's so many other mediating factors. It's certainly a strong contributing factor through mechanisms such as satiety and fiber and displacing other higher um, higher calorie and fat foods, but, but it's sort of indirect. Um, other evidence, macular degeneration with some fruits and vegetables that contain lutein and other things. And then limited evidence through um, disease processes such as inflammatory bowel disease or diabetic retinopathy, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, other inflammatory conditions and so forth. So certainly um, a, a spectrum of strength of evidence. And the strength of evidence is based on uh, what types of information, what types of studies we get this information from. So you know, strongest evidence comes from um, prospective epidemiologic types of data where follow large groups over time either just over time or in response to interventions, um, certainly randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses of those. Uh, less strong evidence comes from just cross-sectional data or case control type studies. So you know, looking at the type of research that is done and where this evidence is coming from can help inform how 
strongly we how strongly confident we are in terms of of the evidence and protective evidence and um, this type of data has come from a lot of different publications this was pulled in particular from um, some 2012 publications so in terms of cardiovascular disease risk we do have some pretty good evidence if you look at at relative risk so it's comparing uh, risk of populations that have a certain intake or certain behavior. And if you compare uh, fruit and vegetable consumption of the part of the population that has very low intake with the higher uh, intake, so the two extremes of the population, three or more or one or less, you get relative risks less than one. So if a relative risk is less than one, it is protective. So it, it means that as you increase fruit and vegetable, you get a lower risk of different types of heart disease. In this case, uh, ischemic heart mortality, cardiovascular mortality, all types, and all cause mortality. And these were data that are adjusted for a lot of different things, age, sex, race, um, various others. So when you have that sort of positive inverse association, um, and this was seen in a number of different studies, this happens to be from 2002, but a number of studies have seen this, you get a fairly good uh, confidence level with, with that sort of inverse effect. Looking at um, cross-sectional data as opposed to prospective long-term data, you still see fairly strong evidence of correlations with higher intake of fruits and vegetables and improvements in outcome measures. Um, in this case, that was really markers. So if you have just a cross-sectional data, you can only see really biomarkers. So these are, are surrogate markers of disease endpoints. In this case, it was inflammatory status, like uh, CRP levels. Um, and in this case, it was, again, inflammation markers and oxidative stress. And so um, these are, are good, strong data. Ideally, you'd like to see that and see how it associates with development of disease and uh, morbidity and mortality outcomes. So what is it that's, that's special about fruits and vegetables? We know that they have good vitamins, vitamin C, folate, variety of different other components, minerals, potassium, magnesium, and so forth, have good levels of fiber, some more than others, but good soluble fiber that we know helps with bowel function, may lower cholesterol some. Um, but when you've done a, a literature search and, and looked at the evidence that's out there, and individual trials taking just fiber intake or vitamin C, and there have been experimental evidence looking at does this one component have the same effect on biomarkers and disease outcome, and things get diluted out. You don't see the strength of evidence. So, you know, I, I don't think that the effect of higher fruits and vegetables is because of solely the antioxidant capacity of vitamin C and its effect on preventing disease. Nor do I think it's just the fiber that is in apples or others. So I, it really becomes a question of what's the synergistic effect of this whole food that contains multiple different components. And we can continue to slice and dice and say, well, is it this component or that? Is it phytonutrients or bioactive food components? I do think they contribute, but I think it's the, the total package, the synergistic effect of everything. And so that's part of why some of the, the supplement trials, let's give someone a supplement of, of vitamin C or vitamin A. It helps tremendously when you're looking at populations that are deficient in those, that are malnourished and deficient. Huge impact. Dr. Brown mentioned some of those trials with vitamin A and other micronutrient supplementation. But if you take a population that is in our, um, in our United States population, for the most part there's not widespread rampant deficiency diseases. We may have some subclinical deficiencies, but just giving a, a supplement is probably not going to make a huge impact in terms of outcome for chronic disease. But having higher intakes of the food product that contains this synergistic package 
will potentially make a difference. And so I think that's where um, our effort continues to, to be and should be placed. I'll talk some for uh, part of the rest of the talk about some of the bioactive components in fruits and vegetables. And those are ones that, that they're not necessarily traditional nutrients like vitamin C or folate, but they do have biologic activity. We're learning much more about them and they can affect epigenetic effects. We heard a little bit about that. That's the, the non-DNA coding uh, regions that affects um, outcomes, fetal outcomes. It may um, have an effect on, on cell signaling, uh, changes in intracellular signaling or cell cycle. Um, we definitely have evidence that some of these phytochemicals can affect cellular functions. So dietary phytochemicals, it's sort of a catch-all phrase. Um, they're really a, a broad group of compounds, very diverse in structure and function. Um, they come to us not only in fruits and vegetables, but in beverages as well, tea, cocoa, that type of thing, a little bit in wine. And they, as I mentioned, can modulate cellular processes. And they do have some um, commonalities in terms of structure. This is a, a structure of, of a type of, of flavonoid. Many of the phytochemicals have this polyphenolic ring structure. Flavonoids tend to have three rings, an A, B, and C ring with substituent groups, hydroxyl groups and glycosidic groups and other things off the sides. There are other phenolic groups that may be just single rings. Um, resveratrol, elagic acid, various others. But they're, they're rich in fruits and vegetables and, um, and help support some of the data that we have of fruits and vegetables having beneficial health effects and altering health in a positive way. So of phytochemicals, um, this three-ring polyphenol group has a number of different subgroups. Um, you may have heard the names, actually, even in the popular press. You open up some of these sort of Sunday uh, newspaper magazine type things that talk about nutrition and health, and you see flavanols and flavonoids and um, epicatechin and quercetin and so forth thrown around. You can go to the web and see products that are being marketed that are drinks. Um, you go to the, the grocery store and there are drinks on the, the shelf. So knowing a little bit about them I think is helpful. Um, some of the anthocyanins, those often are red pigments found in berries, strawberries, um, uh, raspberries, blackberries, even in plums, grapes, any of the fruits and vegetables that are, are purple and, and red and blue colored. Flavanols, um, this is a fairly big group in terms of usual intake. These come from onions predominantly, also from tomatoes, various others. Um, catechin is another big group, again from apples, tea, cocoa, um, other fruits and vegetables. Um, and then proanthocyanins are, are oligomers, or, or linked groups. And those come from cocoa and tea, apples, peanuts. And then soy, uh, soybeans, tofu, soy milk, and so on, contain isoflavones, which um, can have some estrogenic type of effects as well. So a very a big and diverse group, and um, eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, you know, that sort of boring recommendation, eat a variety, is, is where you get in a, a variety of these different compounds. So questions that should be um, maybe arising in your mind about the health promoting effect of these different bioactive compounds, these phytonutrients. You know, we have a lot of data about the, the um, vitamins, the minerals, but similar nutrition principles apply to investigating or thinking about these phytochemicals. You know, are they absorbed? We know that nutrients to have biologic effects to become required and so forth um, are things that are utilized by our body. They have to get across that uh, cell barrier in the gut wall. So are these phytonutrients absorbed? Do they get to their target tissues? What is the target tissue? Is that a, a gut cell, a epithelial cell? Is it the liver? Is it a vascular cell? How much is absorbed? Um, 
how do we study it? That's more sort of on the research end, but you know, do we study it in humans or animals or cells? Um, ultimately, we, we want to know what the biologic effects are. How, how does it have an effect on, on a disease or, or a process? And is it the same in a healthy individual? If I eat so much quercetin a day, is it the same effect on me as it is somebody who has heart disease or somebody who has diabetes? Because that influences what sort of recommendations we make for different groups. Um, you know, what are the components? How do we monitor intake and after it's consumed? And ultimately, what are the implications for human health? Should, be, should we be making specific recommendations? Is it fine to say, eat lots of fruits and vegetables? Or should we break it up, X number of fruits, X number of vegetables? Or should we be saying, eat these many total, but you should eat two that are blue and purple and red, two that are orange and yellow, and you know, so on. How do we make these recommendations, and should it be across the board? How do we make them appropriate for different ethnic and cultural groups, and for different parts of the life cycle? So just some quick facts about dietary flavonoids in general. Um, we, we don't have good, real good hard estimates of how much because the database for what's contained in the foods is not complete. But we think that most people, if they're eating five or more fruits and vegetables a day, are getting about a gram of flavonoids a day. It's a fairly significant amount. And the major sources based on, on food intake data seems to be from apples, grapes, onions, uh, citrus fruits, tea, soy, so it depends a little bit on the population being studied. But the more common fruits and vegetables that you think of, at least in, in our population. If we uh, looked at other populations, there would be more uh, predominance in other fruits and vegetables. So to answer some of that list of questions that I had posed on the, the slide or two before, we need to know a little bit about their absorption, digestion, metabolism, and excretion, or ADME. And so some of the factors that affect that are things like um, we know that each person is fairly individual. There are differences in, in transport of different compounds across the intestinal wall between individuals. We, we have um, biotransformation enzymes, phase one and phase two enzymes, that take compounds that we eat, just like medications we take, and transform them to make it easier to have them circulate in the body, easier to excrete. And that affects how the form in which they reach the target tissue. And are those forms still something that affect the target tissue? Um, our, our gut microbiota, the microorganisms in our, our large bowel, those are, we're finding out more and more, have a huge effect on our health and on intra-individual variability. And they can affect the metabolism of some of these phytochemicals as well. Um, age, gender, physiologic state, and the, the diet, the food matrix. Perhaps a phytochemical that we get from tea may be absorbed and digested differently than from a solid food or a processed food. And so we, we ultimately want to know how all these things are affected and what it does to exposure at the tissue level and ultimately to health effects. So these are, are sort of uh, research questions, but they do help our understanding of making some decisions about what sort of individual and population-based recommendations we should make. Um, we do know that flavonoids are absorbed. They um, they come in a slightly different format in the fruits and vegetables. They tend to have sugar molecules on them. The sugar molecules are broken off in the gut, and we absorb the egg glycone, or without the, the sugar. Um, usually, they're absorbed and appear in the bloodstream fairly quickly, most of them within um, two to five hours. But some, like soy, stick around for six to eight before they peak in the blood. Um, Plasma concentration is pretty low, micromolar levels, really tiny. But that is at the same level or greater, if you think about it, in comparison to hormones. Hormones often circulate at picomolar levels. So, you know, in that range, it, it, 
it's a reasonable amount. Um, they are metabolized, so they're glucuronidated, methylated, sulfated, just like hormones and other drugs are. They circulate around. They do reach target tissues. We can take biopsies of target tissues or, or aspirates and find that flavonoids, isoflavones, various other compounds are present there in the target tissue. So they get taken up by the tissue. They, in cell culture, they do modulate cellular activities. So they are bioactive. They are excreted mostly through the urine, um, some in the fecal matter, and the bioavailability is kind of limited, 20% or so. So of that gram, we are not getting all of that into our bloodstream, into the tissues, a small amount. But it seems to be something potentially that can make a difference. They're related, they've been postulated to be related to progression of chronic diseases. These on, on this side, uh, we know a little bit more about and have a little bit more confidence level in, in some of the data. Um, you can take food intake data and look at it in terms of fruit and vegetable intake and incidence of disease. You can also extrapolate that to flavonoid intake and look at incidence of disease. And there is a, a pretty much an inverse relationship so that as this looks at mortality and flavonoid intake and as you get higher intake you see a lower rate of age-adjusted heart mortality. So low intake high disease and mortality, high intake, uh, low mortality. Similar um, relationship as with fruit and vegetable. So it, you could say, well, this is just a surrogate for fruit and vegetable. They do track together. But as we find out more about some of their biologic effects, I, and you can't get this sort of relationship that's replicated exactly by just giving a vitamin C supplement. There have been trials that have looked at that. Uh, sous -V max trial and others. And so there's something special about the whole package of fruits and vegetables. There have been a number of different studies that look at intervention studies or made analyses that look at flavonoids, food sources, and effect on, in this case, cardiovascular risk. And most of them are have positive associations, so that inverse association, higher intake, lower risk, and, and this is in several populations. Uh, this has been a meta-analysis of a lot of different studies. This is Iowa Women's study. So even in the Midwest of the United States that you don't think of as the, the fruit basket of California of high fruit and vegetable, you still, still see that relationship. Uh, you see it across European and US populations. There have also been studies in Asian populations, and you see similar effect. So it does seem to be something generalizable just remind you that epidemiologic trials can't necessarily give you exact cause and effect, but they can give you very powerful data sets of, of association with disease risk. And randomized clinical trials can, can reinforce that data. Cellular effects, there's a, a whole host of possibilities that we can see in cell culture and that we can see in animal studies and we feel are most likely probably replicated in human studies. Everything from um, changing enzyme activation or inhibition, looking at changes in transcription factors, uh, gene expression and nuclear receptors, modulating inflammatory response, cell cycle regulation, uh, receptor uh, competition, cell signaling pathways, and so everything from genomic and epigenomic to post-translational effects and, and looking at specific modulators of a, a particular gene, such as PPAR, there are definitely effects related to particular flavonoids. So we think these biologic effects are certainly real, and how they translate to disease outcomes seems to be um, a, a real effect as well. And so. You know, from the time of Hippocrates on, people have looked at nutrition and looking at nutrition as, as a medicine, not just a food. We know it has many, many multiple effects from emotional, psychological, social aspects, as well as health promotion and disease prevention. Um, now, I think the public is, is aware of that concept, definitely. They're very aware of it. They're very interested in nutrition, but not always aware of what they need to do to, to become healthier, to have that optimal health. 
And, and the idea of doing it is sometimes different than actually taking behavioral action to do that. Um, and I think we're all human. We'd like to know, is there a magic bullet? Is there just, you know, if I eat this food? And so you've seen a lot in the, the lay literature about superfoods and miracle foods. And a lot of those are fruits and vegetables. I don't know that anyone in isolation can have the miracle effect, but if we encourage consumption of, of a wide variety, it, it can certainly make a difference. So, you know, how do we achieve this higher fruit and vegetable intakes? What's effective? What sort of messages should we be giving? What sort of interventions? It's really hard to say exactly. I think a starting place is looking at dietary patterns, not just a particular food, and applying these dietary patterns to uh, different groups in a culturally appropriate manner is part of, I think, uh, going to be the key. You know, the DASH diet is something that is um, very, very popular in the United States right now in terms of the medical community promoting it as, as a nice, healthy um, dietary approach. The Mediterranean dietary style is also um, being promoted in the medical community as well as in the, the lay community. I think these are two starting points that could be used but need to be definitely adapted to all these different factors, cultural, ethnic diversity, literacy, um, life cycle stage, and so forth. So I think, you know, can we, can we take a message and pitch it, if you will, at different parts of of the ecologic model? Can we give more global messages for, for the population, for public health, and then can we take that and modify and make it specific to different community groups and, and have uh, consistency and redundancy across that spectrum? And that's part of the problem in, in nutrition is that there's so many different opinions and so much information, not all of which is consistent out there. But this, just for a a uh, reminder and background, the DASH diet was an intervention that was done uh, in the 90s looking at um, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It was one of the first that looked at a total diet effect, not a specific nutrient, comparing a general American diet to one that was high in fruits and vegetables, eight and a half servings versus about three, still relatively high in fat, um, to a DASH diet that was lower in fat had even higher fruits and vegetables, had modest levels of meat, some several servings of low-fat dairy, and, and meat substitutes. And what they saw was actually very powerful, that within two weeks of being on this diet, at weight maintenance levels, they saw changes significantly uh, lowered blood pressure, something that's clinically significant. And so, and they saw this in a multi-ethnic population. So this was done at multi-centers somewhere in the south, included high African-American population, some Hispanic population, and so forth. One key was that they provided all the meals. So you know, to translate this into individuals making these choices, making their own meals, is much more difficult. They have done those studies. The effect that they've seen is still beneficial, not quite as, as powerful as this, because it's human nature coming into play. But this is um, sort of a, a healthy lifestyle, and this goes along with the prudent diets, the, the various other healthy dietary patterns that, that are um, in a lot of the literature. And you can go to the website through um, National Heart Lung Institute, NIH, um, government websites to get information about that. Another is the Mediterranean diet, and this is a, a dietary. Whoops, I'm sorry. A dietary period pyramid that's a sort of modification of the dietary pyramid that we used to have, but for Mediterranean lifestyle, where the uh, the base is really filled with fruits and vegetables and whole grains, and a wide variety of those, uh, encouraging healthy, active lifestyle. Uh, the protein is, is really focusing on, on fish and, and healthy, uh, lower fat, high in omega-3 fatty acid type of proteins, uh, limited other proteins, and then limited sweets and so forth, with encouraging water, um, wine, 
red wine in, in moderation as that's consistent with their lifestyle, and olive oil as the predominant fat. And w there have been a lot of different trials about that. One that information is coming out now is the, the PREDIMED trial, the Provincion Condaita uh, Mediterranea, and that is very large, seven and a half uh, 7,000 individuals, and it's a multi-center trial in Europe. So it's not just looking at Spain or Greece, but it's applying this type of intervention to other European um, groups. And they're comparing Mediterranean diet with olive oil compared to Mediterranean diet with nuts versus just a, a sort of a healthy, low-fat um, diet, American Heart Association, dietary guidelines type of diet. And what they're finding is that uh, these Mediterranean diet approaches are providing additional benefits beyond the, the healthy, low-fat type of diet uh, in inflama I'm sorry. inflammatory biomarkers, uh, bar markers of lipoproteins, reduced diabetes incidence, and they're following these individuals for up to 7 to 11 years. Right now we just have one year and four year follow-up, but, but this looks pretty striking. Um, of the decreased incidence in diabetes. So I think some of these dietary patterns that are really based on plant foods, you know, fruits and vegetables, it doesn't mean it has to be a vegetarian approach, but one that is high in fruits and vegetables provides a very powerful approach to promoting health. But the question is how to make this relevant, how to implement it, how to help individuals to choose a diet within these parameters that really meets their lifestyle and, and their, um, their culture. There's some predictors of high fruit and vegetable intake. We know that uh, individuals, some of us are super tasters and broccoli and things taste too bitter and we don't like those others. Uh, it doesn't matter. That can affect it. Females tend to eat more fruits and vegetables than males higher age as opposed to younger, um, higher socioeconomic, educational status. Um, barriers are cost. You know, for low income populations, it, it can be a very, definitely a barrier, as well as availability, just availability of grocery stores, of farmers markets, and of others in the community. Time to prepare the foods or knowledge of how to use some of these different fruits and vegetables and, and cultural norms. And so some of the things that Dr. Schultz was talking about is actually you know, helping individuals be introduced to new foods, helping suggest ways to prepare them. Um, in the cooperative extension approach, which is uh, working with clients directly in their homes and in communities, almost always involves <coughs> demonstrations or participation in actually preparing and consuming food. And that seems to be very powerful for individuals. They're more, much more likely to try things and implement them than if they just sit and passively learn things. And so that goes back to different learning styles styles and educational styles? Should it be just a, you know, conveying knowledge as we have been here today, unfortunately, or can it be a, a participatory type of learning and an adult style where individuals contribute their, their expertise and their thoughts? So the delivery is important as well as the content and the information. So in conclusion, I think we do know that there's scientific evidence supporting high fruit and vegetable consumption for a lot of different conditions. Um, it, is it due only to the flavonoids? No, but I think they're contributing factors. Um, we know that they are biologically active. Uh, benefits seem to be seen uh, with intake levels that are above our current USDA recommendation. Really, USDA is five or more servings, but really the benefits truly seem to be seen with these much higher levels of intake through, say, the DASH diet or, or Mediterranean. And, and we know it's low. We know there's a problem. We know we need to, to make some changes. And so I think we'll hear more tomorrow about ways to implement some of those changes. I hope you've gained some information that's food for thought today. And I think we probably have a, a couple closing remarks before we, we take off. Um, but I hope that tomorrow you'll come ready to, to learn and to hear about some additional interventions. Thank you.